Welcome back, episode number 231. Sorry for no show last week. Been a little busy with a lot of stuff. I'll move this in a little bit. Tommy Maroon Sports Show, WCTV. Always a lot of fun here on Wadsworth Community Television because we're going to talk about the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Cleveland Guardians because it is that time of year again, folks. First things first, the Cleveland Cavaliers. Looking at the points per game. We're looking at team stats to be exact. Led by that guy as of late, Mr. Darius Garland. So there has been that. So we'll see what happens. As the Cavs have had 112.7 points per game. 47.8% field goal percent. Shooting 36.6 from three-point land. 76.2% from the free throw line. 43.2, or no, 43.8 rebounds per game. 27.9 assists per game, 7.2 blocks per game, and 4. Point, no, 7.2 steals per game, 4.7 blocks per game. Oh, my. And, oh, my, it has not been looking that good for the Cavs lately, hasn't it? Dropping 3 out of the last 4, dropping 7 out of the last 10, and falling down to 4th place in the Eastern Conference. And watch out, Orlando is right on their tail a game and a half out. This was the only game the Cavs won in the last four games, the one that you're looking at right now. But we'll get to the other games right now. Cavs at Timberwolves was a 104-91 loss. Garland put up 19. Karis LeVert put up 16, while Jared Allen had 15 points and 13 rebounds. Anthony Edwards, 16 points, 13 rebounds. Mike Conley, 21 points. And then Nash Reed, 18. Cavs were up by 7 in the second half. But then again, the Wolves had five more rebounds and assists than the Cavaliers in Minnesota, by the way. They're doing a dandy. They're only half a game out of the uh, wild, or top seed rather for the um, Western Conference. The Denver Nuggets are leading the West. And, of course, Boston has wrapped up the East. They are 57-17. and 17. My goodness, they are one of, if not the best teams in the entire NBA. At least I'm pretty sure we all know that by now. And as we all know by now, if you watch Cavs at the Heat, it was not good. It was a 121-84 to loss. That's 94-104. That was about, I think, 37. Let me check it out for a second. Yup, it is indeed a 37-point loss. Evan Mobley only Cavalier with double-digit points with 15, while seven Heat players had double-digit points. The lead score for the Heat, Haywood Highsmith, 18. Heat had a 45-point lead at one point and had 10 more steals compared to the Cavs. And in this game right here, at least the Cavs won this one. 115-92. to Three Cavs players had 17 points, George Niang being one of them. He also had five threes. Darius Garland had 15 points, 10 assists. Meanwhile, Brandon Miller, 24 points, 8 rebounds. While Miles Bridges had 13 points. Cavs were winning for almost the entire game and had 19 more assists than the Hornets. That's pretty impressive, I will admit that. Cavs at the Hornets the next game, which was last night. It was rather tough because the Cavs lost by 7. Yeah, never good. Especially when you're up by 10 after the first quarter. And when you're winning at halftime and then everything just falls apart and score just a measly 15 points in the fourth quarter. Not excusable at all. Oh, man, oh, man. Uh, Jared Town, 24 points. Max Struis, 19, plus five threes. Sam Merrill, 17 points. He also had five threes. While Brandon Miller had 31 points. Miles Bridges and Trey Mann, 17 points for the two of them. Cavs are up by 14 in the first and had three more assists than the Charlotte Hornets. Just couldn't get the job done, unfortunately. Just could not get the job done. Looking at the schedule, remaining schedule for the Cavaliers, let me pull it up. Where is it? It's right here on the Cavs app. I think there are nine more games to go or something like that. What I do know is that the next game is... Uh, hosting the Philadelphia 76ers tomorrow night, 7.30. Then on Easter Sunday, the Cavs will play the Denver Nuggets at Denver. Then it will be Utah, Phoenix, Lakers, Clippers. And then closing out the season, playing the 
uh, Memphis Grizzlies, Indiana Pacers, and Charlotte Hornets. So it's going to be a little bit bumpy on the way out. I don't know about the Sixers. Maybe that's a loss. And maybe or Nuggets will definitely be a loss. Jazz, I think, should be a win. Suns will be a loss. Lakers, I think they're starting to heat up. You know what? They'll split the L.A. series 2-4. and four. Um, Grizzlies should be a win. Pacers, I don't know. It might be a bit of a mediocre stretch towards the end of the season. I'll tell you that. But you know what I'll also tell you? The Cleveland Guardians are finally back. Yes, sir. I can't believe it. It is a great and glorious sight to see. What? Look at the schedule, shall we? Yes, we shall. The first 10 games for Cleveland will be on the road, consisting of games against the Oakland Athletics, the Seattle Mariners, and then the Minnesota Twins. And then the home opener, which is coinciding with the solar eclipse against the White Sox. Of course, the eclipse is supposed to happen earlier in the day, and then the game first pitch is at 5-10. The Guardians played the Red Sox in April for both series. I think that's worth noting. I also think it's worth noting is that the Yankees are sandwiched in between the White Sox and the Red Sox um, after the first home series against Chicago, of course. The defending champion Texas Rangers will be hosting the Guardians from May 13th to the 15th, and then they'll come up to Cleveland on August 23rd to the 25th. And then the Guardians will be home against the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks, who reached the World Series last year, lost in a very boring five-game side. I will admit that. August 5th to the 7th. And before that, it's going to be a big series taking on the Baltimore Orioles. You see that right there towards the bottom left of your screen, a four-game series against the Orioles. First, second, third, fourth, and then Arizona, Arizona, Arizona. Guardians will play the tough. Tough Dodgers, my goodness. They have already built up a team and then some. My heavens, it will be uh, from the 4th to the, wait, will it be? No, the 6th to the 8th, I beg your pardon. And after that will be the White Sox. And after that it will be the Tampa Bay Rays, a four-game series. That won't be easy. Never sleep on the Rays. They always do well, in my opinion. But you know what is a good thing? The final five games for the Guardians, even though the first ten games are on the road, the final five games will be home. And they will be two against the Reds. You see them right there at the bottom right of your screen on Tuesday, Wednesday. And then the final three games against the Houston Astros. That will be actually pretty interesting considering the fact that the Astros are pretty good at what they do, even when they don't cheat. But, yeah, looking at everything out there, the Guardians are playing every team again this year because just like in, uh, what do you call it, basketball and hockey, you're playing every team now in the majors, which I think is something that was long overdue. And tonight is the first game of the season. Shane Bieber will be working the mound. Alex Wood will be his opponent. That's going to be really exciting to see. I hope that the Guardians can win it. They should beat Oakland. They should win this series against Oakland. If they don't, that would be kind of sad. But you never know. Most games are at 6-10 or 7-10 at Progressive Field for the home games, of course. And now let's look at the roster. The pitching staff is really what's It's the strong suit for Cleveland, consisting of guys like Tristan McKenzie, Tyner Bybee, Gavin Williams, Hunter Gaston. Who could possibly forget Shane Bieber? Those are your main five guys anchoring the pitching. Well, Austin Hedges, a catcher who played for the Guardians in the past, is returning here after playing elsewhere in the year past. I think he was a Ranger last year. Let me check. Austin Hedges, of yeah, course. Yeah, won a ring. Yes, thank you, John. And he was with the Pirates, too. He was with the Pirates, apparently. He did win a world championship with the Rangers last year. So, yes, that is true. And what's also true, he's probably going to be back up maybe to Bo Naylor. Bo Naylor, a good catcher. And his brother, you know his brother by now, Josh Naylor. And you know his sidekick, or really maybe the main star of the show, Jose Ramirez. Jose Ramirez is really good at what he does by now, but I'm pretty sure you all know that. Four outfielders for the Guardians, and they 
really uh, specialize in the field and speed rather than hitting. I guess Stephen Kwan would be the best hitter, but he kind of struggled last year after having a tremendous rookie season. But enough about that. Who's managing the Guardians? We all know Terry Francona is gone. That man right there is managing the Guardians, Mr. Stephen Vogt. He is the new man leading the Guardians, wearing the number 12 that Francisco Lindor wore a few years back. He is not even 40, but the reason why the Guardians got him, from what I heard, he's a likable guy. He's fun, he's relaxed, he's calm, and he just loves being with the players, and he's a man of the players, he's a man of the fans, and that's why the Guardians wound up getting him. Yeah, Steve votes 39, by the way. He was a catcher for the most part, and he spent a vast majority of his career in Oakland, so... He'll be returning to Oakland tonight. We'll see how the crowd will welcome him. I mean, this is a man that hit 82 home runs in his career and last played just two years ago. Yeah, he played this decade too. He was a coach with Oakland, I think, last year. And then Cleveland's like, you know what, we want you. And he signed with the Guardians to take over. Steve Vogt also the all-star Appearances in 2015 and 2016 in Cincinnati and San Diego. He was one of the best catchers, really, in the mid-2010s. I do remember that name, Stephen Vogt, uh, growing up as a kid. I'm like, you know, and he's pretty good. And sure enough, he was one of the best catchers in the league. He was an experience, but you know the Guardians are going to try to win for him. They want him to be happy, but it won't be easy. It's a tall task going up against or to replace a man like Terry Francona. That is not the easiest thing in the world. He's one of the greatest managers in Major League history, as you know by now. But hopefully Stephen Vogt can do it. And it was a rough season for Cleveland last year. Of course, one of the two losing seasons for Mr. Terry Francona during his time here in Cleveland. It was a 76-1 season, the worst season in the Terry Francona regime. 76 and 86, so hopefully Stephen Vogt can do something that not even Tito could do here and win a World Series. Of course, Francona was one win away in 2016. I don't like to be reminded of that. But you know what? Maybe Stephen Vogt has what it takes. And, of course, that's, uh, that's basically all we have to cover. We're not done yet, folks. Don't worry. We're not done yet. There's still a lot of stuff coming up here in the wonderful world of of what do you call it? Highland Ball and Wallace on WHBW. Yes, sir, because there will be nothing Monday. Tuesday will be baseball at Copley. Wednesday, I think that'll be BW action. Yes, BW women's will cross against John Carroll. Then the fourth is softball against Stellet. And then Friday, I don't see anything going on Friday. So that might be the next time we talk. So, yep, that's all that's going on. Be sure you subscribe to WHBW on YouTube. Let me pull up my YouTube channel for a second. We have over 1,000 videos on that channel, 560 subscribers. That's not a lot. <laughs> I'll be quite frank with you. That's not a lot, but you know what? It's better than nothing, better than what most channels have, I think. Well, folks, that's it. We're done for the day. Till next time, I'm Tom Rune thanking you for watching. And until next time, I'll talk to you next week. Goodbye, everybody. You are watching WCTV, Wadsworth Community Television.